industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, and food security. So uh, having come all the way to do the presentation, I think we ought to give him a chance to talk for 20 minutes. So we're, 20 minutes. Yes, Be because we're going to do closing and, oh, sorry, you are the person. Uh, well, it's really 20 and the 10 is for interaction. Because you, you do have 30 altogether, but you, you speak for 20 and then the, the okay, welcome. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad. Sorry we were at lunch. We didn't think you were coming. Okay. All right. Um, is, it, is it set up? Good. Thank you. So we have here Mr. Samori. It's, it's, uh, uh, Darlington Ahiale Akogo instead of uh, Sam, Mr. Samori. And he's going to talk to us on the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence and food security. That's our last speaker uh, for the day before we wind up AMASA 15. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, so uh, in my defense, I'm actually not late. The, the time I was supposed to do my talk was 3.30. And so I think there was a change of plan. So yeah, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so my name is Darlin. Is the clicker available? Okay, so yes, um, I'll try to make it worth it. <laughs> so yeah, my name is uh, Darlington Ahiala Kogo, and uh, I have an organization called Kara Agro AI. So we focus on artificial intelligence and fourth industrial revolution technologies for agriculture. So I'll give you a little bit of information of how what we are building and these technologies are impacting agriculture. And uh, yeah, so we can begin. Okay, you, you can try, you can try fixing it while well, also changing it, okay. So yes, um, so a little bit of information about myself. The organization I mentioned, Caragro, is part of another organization called Gudra. So Gudra broadly, we, attempting to solve what we term as the challenging problems of Africa. So we have a series of projects across healthcare, agriculture, as well as education. Beyond that, uh, I'm also part of United Nations AI for Health focus group. So I work on policies on artificial intelligence and how they should be used within the healthcare sector. I'm a lecturer at Academic City College where I teach artificial intelligence. I'm part of uh, AI Expo Africa. I'm, I'm on the advisory board and it's ambassador to West Africa. So this is the largest AI community in Africa. In general, I work as an AI engineer. Okay. I work as an AI engineer, researcher, uh, lecturer, policymaker. Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so these are some of the solutions that we built in healthcare. Next slide. So yes, in general, we've worked with uh, UN. We have a project with Imperial College of London around malaria. And then uh, we also do, uh, we are working on vaccine development. So developing more effective vaccines using artificial intelligence for research. Oh boy. So some of the things that we learned in healthcare, uh, the power of artificial intelligence we are trying to bring into agriculture. So I'll show you what we've done so far and then the potential of what we are doing, especially when it comes to ensuring food security in Africa and the world. Next slide. Yeah, so we also train people in artificial intelligence right here in Ghana. Uh, the next one is actually going to be beginning on the 23rd of November. 
And is the clicker working now? Okay, next slide. Yes, yeah, so if you've ever had the term fourth industrial revolution, how many people know what that is? Can you just gently put your hands up if you do? Okay. How many have just heard the term fourth industrial revolution? Okay. So those who know what it is, most of them haven't heard of it. <laughs> no, but anyway, so if you are a fan of the World Economic Forum like I am, you hear them uh, play around or mention the term fourth industrial revolution a bunch of times. Please go back. Yeah, so everyone is kind of, everyone is quite focused on no, the fourth industrial revolution. Yes. So everyone is quite focused on this term and it's, been, it's become a bass term actually. So what it really means is that there's a convergence of technology. If you look at the industrial revolution, it started with us using, it started with, no, yes, go back. Yes. So it started with us using water and steam power some decades ago, and then we moved to using electricity. It's working now. I have to get closer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it started with us using um, steam and then water. That's how we started mechanizing our production. Then after that, we harnessed the power of electricity, which allowed us to do a lot. Basically, almost everything we depend on here, including this microphone and trying to get this clicker to work, all depend on electricity. Then after that came the computer and information age, which is also responsible for a lot of things. I can see most of you have uh, laptops in front of you. You all have mobile devices. This is all due to the computer and information age. Now, the fourth industrial revolution is similar to the third, but it takes it to a whole new different level. There are certain technologies related to the information age technologies, but the pace at which they are growing, the pace at which they are influencing every single sector in the world requires that they be looked differently. And the impact level is actually at a rate that has never been seen in human history. So it's actually blurring the lines between the biological and physical innovations. And it's making us question what it means to be human. Yes. So when I'm saying this, one of the key technologies that is making people wonder if it's right to even build it, uh, are we attempting to create human beings as artificial intelligence? And then you have other technologies like drones, robotics, Internet of Things, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology. And so there's a lot of rapid breakthroughs in all of these technologies, and it's happening all at the same time. And uh, so the main technology behind this is AI. What AI simply is, is an attempt to take what human beings are good at, which we have a lot of experts in this room. So what uh, you have expertise in, can we take that? and make machines be just as good as that, or even maybe better. That is basically what artificial intelligence is. And also connected to that is machine learning. Now, machine learning is under AI, but the interesting thing about that is that for people who build these machines and computer programs, for machine learning, we don't have to write any of the things. We just gather data on what you do best. So you have like, uh, plant pathologists, those who deal with uh, diseases affecting plants, all we have to do is collect data on the things that they do, show it to a machine, and the machine can be able to detect diseases. So these are some of the things that we are able to do. And also big data. So a lot of conversations have been had in the last three days. All these conversations are related to, in some sense, data. This whole event can be captured in data. So once you gain that data, can you use machines can you use uh, information technology to be able to derive certain insight from all this data that you've collected that is what big data is about so this is one application of the te technologies i've mentioned uh, self-driving cars cars that drive themselves and they actually roll there are some parts of the world like california if you go to 
Google has Waymo and they drive themselves. You can take it as a, like when you take Uber. It's already working now. So how do these technologies I've mentioned concern or impact agriculture? Some of the problems in agriculture where you've heard a lot about this past few days, take for example, 234 million people in sub-Saharan Africa undernourished. That equates to about one in four people that are undernourished. And about 50% of expected crop yield is lost. So this whole food loss actually causes about $940 billion worldwide. And the challenge now is, especially in Africa, we are supposed to produce 60% more than we do today in the next 15 years. So how can we do that? We don't think that business as usual will do. A lot of innovations in fertilizer and in the development of fertilizers will help. But we think a whole new rapid approach to agriculture is necessary. So this brings us to precision agriculture. With precision agriculture, the whole objective is that you have these technologies that can collect information and then with those information they can do a lot so i remember during our session here i was talking about the fact that we were supposed to focus on sunflower and then uh, uh, oil palm this this plant generates information so if we had sensors collecting information we could tell their needs we could tell how much water how much fertilizer how much pesticide they needed at the exact time and the benefit of this is that we reduce wastage. Yes. So this is actually a system we built. This is not theory. This is a system we built called Cara Grow AI. The technology I described, which is being able to do what human experts do, this system is able to detect diseases in plants just through a mobile phone so you take a photo of a plant leaf and it detects diseases in it so we have the beta version out we've been testing it and also adding uh, more features to it the clicker has been an issue yeah so this is actually showing you how the system works so you take a photo of the plant leaf And then after that, the AI system just processes, it looks at the image to see if it will detect any disease. If it's healthy, it tells you it's healthy. If it's not, then it tells you this plant leaf is not healthy. And also, so currently this system supports about 10 different crops. So you just select the crop that you want to take the photo of that leaf, and then it can give you the analysis. So the power of this is, I remember when the representative of the peasant farmers mentioned how uh, companies international companies are trying to take advantage of them there are certain things that huge companies have access to that small scale farmers don't have access to the benefit of this is that it's a free app that small scale farmers can then have on their phone just go to their farm they don't need to know about plant pathology they just have to take photos and then the magic works No, wait. <laughs> no, back. No, yes. So we've been getting help from uh, West African Center for Crop Improvement. Their researchers there have been helping us test and improve the system. We also work with University of Ghana, the Crop Science Department. Uh, they've been helping us. So like I mentioned earlier, all we had to do to build the system was collect a lot of images. We collected images of healthy crops and unhealthy crops, and they were named by experts. And based on that, we were able to build a system that learned the difference between healthy and unhealthy crops. And uh, yes, to improve that system, all we need to do is keep collecting more and more images of the various healthy and unhealthy crops. Yes. So if I own a commercial farm, like some of the investors are interested in, if I own a large scale farm, I cannot be going around taking a phone and then taking a bunch of photos. So what are the options with precision agriculture and technology? So these are some of the things that you can also do with this. This is also a platform we are working on. 
so it's able to generate 3d maps you fly drones across the field and it's able to generate 3d and 2d maps and so you basically can sit at home and get a complete 3d realistic view of your farm whilst in your home you don't need to actually go to the farm and so sometimes it looks like this as well and the benefit of this basically is that at the beginning of the planting cycle, you can be able to use this to decide from your home whilst relax that this is where I want to plant my seed and this is the pattern I want to use. Once you start doing that, you can be able to use this to basically monitor irrigation, be able to tell nitrogen uh, level management. And even one interesting thing you can do is that if you have a 3D view of your farm today and then you record it, say, every week, what you can do is that you can combine it and play it. And what happens is that you can see how your farm is changing according to every time. So how is your, time, how is your farm changing? Is it improving? Is it getting worse? You can detect all that. These are things that even human experts miss. If you are dealing with large scale farms, you cannot be able to account for every detail. So why try to rely on your memory when you can capture all that detail and have access to it with uh, these 3D maps? Another thing that we also do is NDVI. In simple terms, this is focused on trying to assess plant health. And it uses what is called a vegetation index. Realistically, this is what it looks like. So all healthy crops are green, all somewhere in between is yellow, and very, very unhealthy crops are red. Next slide. What this basically does is it uses a bunch of fancy technologies. You are using things like infrared camera. So it's on the basis of photosynthesis. So um, the cells are able to take in light but they also emit light back. And we are able to measure the differences between the light they take in and the one they, they, they emit back and then tell how healthy the cell is. In general, the power of this is that you can be able to detect diseases. Pests, you can be able to detect inefficiencies and problems 10 days before it becomes visible to the human eye. Because remember, we are dealing with cells. So even before the issues appear on the surface of the leaf and uh, the fruits, we can detect them right down the cells based on how the cells are reacting to radiation. And once you can do this, that gives the farmer a lot of power. Because if imagine if, so we talk about four army worm, we talk about a lot of diseases affecting tomatoes and a series of other plants and crops in especially our part of the world. Imagine if before it spreads in your farm, you could detect it 10 days earlier when it started on just one single leaf or plant. That is the power we are talking about here. And then you could also take the average of that and then just tally it together. Okay. Yeah. So yes, tally it together across months and then see how you've been doing. And this is important because whatever practice you're doing, you want to know that your practice is actually impacting your farm positively. And you don't want to do it on the basis of, okay, the leaves look nicer or they look healthier today. No. What are the numbers saying? It's your practice ensuring that the plants are healthier. That is everything we are trying to do here. So all across the world, there's this notion of evidence-based healthcare, evidence-based policy making. What we are trying to do here is evidence-based agriculture. Can you say for sure that whatever practice you are introducing to the farm is improving uh, the way you grow your crops? That is what we are trying to do here. Mm. Now, another thing you can also do with drones is manage resources. You can use it for irrig irrigation. So instead of just pouring water all across your field randomly, you can target that this particular section of my field needs just this amount of water. This particular portion doesn't actually need any amount of water, and this one needs more. And the benefit of this is that you can actually save 90% of water by using this approach. So you give every plant just the right amount of water they need. And if you can, by any chance, see the photo behind the text, 
that's what it looks like so there's a drone that fly across the field and uses this ai mentioned artificial intelligence look at that that plant and tells her okay this plant needs this amount of water then it sprays just the amount of water on it beyond that also when it comes to pesticides you can save up to 30 percent so you don't have to just waste it and spray that okay i detected a few uh for army worms i'm just going to spray this whole region no you can do it very much precisely on where the demand calls for that is the power of this now when you have to manually go through your field to check for diseases pests and try to do something about it usually on average causes crop damage about 15 percent you can reduce that to zero because there's no person, there's no human being involved. There's a drone that you just fly from here and the drone goes to the field and does all the work. So there's no damage to any of the crops. And as far as monetarily, it could save farmers 35 to 55%. So take, for example, the peasant farmers in our hypothetical situation that we had to do it. This is something that could actually be helpful to them. We could, we could avoid damaging the land that they, they take so much uh pride in we could ensure that we are making them save a lot of money and also use resources wisely and it's 40 to 60 times faster than a human being trying to spray your farm or trying to irrigate your farms what this translates to basically is imagine doing 1.5 acres in just 10 minutes or take for example going as far as 7 to 10 acres in just one hour this is not theory. This is what is already possible today. Not to talk about tomorrow and then a few years from now. Another thing you can also do is we have these sensors that you insert into the soil and then they record a lot of information from the soil. So they collect things like temperature, uh, volumetric water content. And then with this, you are able to identify what are your irrigation needs as well. And IBM actually estimated that this could save about 50 billion gallons of water per year for farmers. So what we are advocating for is that rather than do educated guesswork, give every plant exactly what they need, guided by technology and data. In summary, that is all that this is about. And we have fancy technologies that allow us to do that. Now, some of our ongoing research is also how can we use artificial intelligence, this technology I talked about, to improve the fertilizers we have. So this is quite similar to what we are doing with vaccines in, for malaria. So for malaria, we are actually looking at cytokines and antibodies, and we are looking for a signature for immunity. And once we identify that signature, we can develop better vaccines. So for fertilizers, plant breeding, uh, and even effective pesticides all these parts they are data involved once you can narrow down which direction you should head into ai allows you to do that and then you can develop more effective solutions for your farm and also another thing we are interested in is in a vertical farm so how to use even way less resources less water not even use any soil at all these are things that we are interested in so to be able to achieve our goal of food security in africa and in the world we are open to partnership collaborations and those who are interested in the drone solution i mentioned uh somewhere late december you should be able to get it on your farm if you're anywhere close to ghana or another african country yeah so with that gratia mille <laughs> <laughs> But thank you very much. You've certainly opened a can of worms, or what should I say, a can of exciting ideas. I'm very much interested in the vaccine. And uh, I mean, we've been spending years looking at biomarkers, and you're telling me that with just a few gadgets, you can identify cytokines, and I have to come and see you. But the, the uh, uh, floor is open for questions, please, and comments. Thank you. Um, we can take about three. Thank you for the nice presentation. My question is, are the gadgets affordable to the small-scale farmer? Thank you. Are the gadgets affordable 
to an ordinary small-scale farmer. Thank you. Yo. Uh, speaker, thank you very much. Uh, is there not too much of a generalization if you just observe one leaf and you say that the whole plant is sick? A sick leaf doesn't mean that the whole plant is sick. Then the other thing is, you're talking about dishing out water. How about if there's excess water and you want to remove it? Do you have the technology for that? I'd be interested, more interested in that because we hear about floods and whatnot. And that's, that's excess water. You want to remove it as opposed to insufficient water and you want to deliver. Thank you. Yeah, in your presentation, you said that if a leaf, if you take a photograph of a leaf, you can say that the leaf is either healthy or diseased. Uh, is that the only limitation? Or can you go further? Like say you take a coconut tree leaf and you take a picture of it. Can you tell whether that leaf is suffering from the beginnings of the St. Paul Wilt disease? Or specify whatever disease is beginning to develop on that coconut leaf? Or is just for say, it's just healthy or unhealthy? <laughs> yeah, so the first question is affordability for small scale farmers. So the app that I mentioned, Caragro AI, is free. It's free. The downside would be whether small scale farmers have the phones to support these apps. So you, some people argue that why not we use, so in the agro, agro tech space, right? A lot of people use what is called USSD. So when you're doing mobile money, you dial some code and then you get some options and you sort of do all you need to do. So people try to use that for agro tech. The problem with that is a limited technology. You cannot do anything uh, when it comes to this powerful problems that we are trying to solve here. But we do know that a lot of small scale farmers still have these Chinese phones. And the Chinese phones support Android. Anything that supports Android can download this app and it's free. We don't charge them a single dime for it. So as far as that, they have access to that. Now the drone one is targeted towards commercial farmers who have large, large fields that they cannot go around taking photos. So we try to have solutions for everyone. Yeah. Even though someone at Waki, whose name I wouldn't mention, said that if you're trying to truly address food security, even though current, currently our food mainly comes from small scale farmers, we need to find a way to convert it to uh, commercial scale farmers. But then at the meantime, we still provide solutions for everyone. The question was, if a leaf is suffering, should you be able to just conclude that the whole plant is unhealthy? So for our app, right, it's not saying that the plant is unhealthy. It's just saying that the particular leaf you took a photo of is unhealthy. And so if you want to, you could take multiple photos of every leaf and then I see if they are unhealthy or not. Now for the drone one, the drone one is so precise that if you zoom in, it's just going down to the particular leaf. So the drone one can at an instant tell you how many leaves on each plant is unhealthy or how many of them are deceased or are suffering from some kind of stress. And the issue of that lets you know if the whole plant is unhelpable and so you just need to destroy that so it doesn't ruin the other plants or if you just take off a few leaves or you use use pesticides or use some sort of uh, uh, sort of countermeasure to address those particular leaves or the whole plant so it gives you that data to know whether if it's just a leaf if it's just the whole plant and there's actually two ways we go about it so you can fly the drone but then there's also the satellite option the satellite option gives you the wide array to cover multiple fields you could basically cover all of ghana with a satellite but the disadvantage is that it's not precise enough. So the drone is low. It flies very low enough that you can capture. If you have a 4K drone, which is very much affordable today in the drone market, 
you can even see an ant, a tiny ant walking through your field. You can identify that because it's taking images in uh, 4K, which is re really, really, really high. So when it comes to identifying, if, you can even go as far as identify if it's just part of a leaf, not even the entire leaf. You can have that precise information if you want to. Yes. So the next question, which was about, uh, ah, I forgot it. Oh, excess water. Yes. Um, that's actually an interesting question. So as, as an engineer and someone who likes to bother myself with problems, I would like for us to maybe have a discussion with that where I'm, I'm then forced to think up if there's a way to address that uh, problem. There should be. But then currently I don't have an answer. So I should, I should come up with it and then contact you and, and provide you the answer if you're still interested. Is that a good agreement? <laughs> okay. Yes. The next question was... Oh, yes. 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 So... Actually, the app that I showed you, Kara Grow AI, which is now on the Android platform, doesn't, I, I didn't want to go into details. It doesn't just tell whether it's healthy or unhealthy. It tells you what specific disease it has. Take, for example, tomatoes now. We support about 10 different diseases. So it can tell you if it's early blight, late blight, uh, and all the other diseases. But then I think for us now, we still need to add in even more diseases because we'll never be able to cover it. And also, there are certain new things that, uh, our partners have pointed out sometimes some things might look like the leaf is diseased but it's just nutrient deficient or it might actually be coming from the uh, from the soil or the the root itself so um, sometimes something might look like leaf blight but it's not so how do you address that or leaf spots so these are some of the things that we are trying to because at the end of the day we are trying to use imagery so we are able we are trying to address this uh so just collecting more images on this we'll be able to address or cover all of this but currently yes it doesn't just tell healthy or unhealthy it tells you one of the diseases that we currently support which is quite a lot yeah yeah i could see this technology can you hear me I can see this technology is working well for diagnosis of um, diseases or whatever. But when you determine, for instance, that water is needed by different plants in the farm, now, how do you deliver the water I mean, what size of drone would you have carrying water to all the different parts? You can get them to precision spots, but how, how can you carry that? And I say this because if it's precision you want, the Israelis have developed um, this drip irrigation which requires that you pipe the whole place. And, and they can measure, they, or, they already measure the amount of moisture or water that a tree, depending on its age, requires. And the whole thing is computerized. So they put the end of the uh, water supply, I mean, the, the pipe to the end, of, to the source of the water, set everything and they go to sleep. And the plant discharges, the system discharges the water for the number of minutes and it stops and everything shuts down. Now, how would you deliver the exact amount of water using a drone? How much water can a drone carry to go around even one hectare of land? Thank you so, so much about this presentation. It's something that I have been looking for. I've been appointed to take care of 
the agricultural research and development in Botswana. Agriculture means not just crops, it also means animals. And those who know that country, the government particularly, I've just discovered that government of Botswana owns farms, large farms. And some of these farms are in the middle of where there are lions and other predators. First question, can this system be able to help me track that government's animals? Number one. Number two, I'm glad about the plants. I've heard about the plants and I understand them better. Can it also tell me when these animals are sick or just tasty or hungry where they are on that farm? Number three, please, 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 please. Can we meet after this and let's talk and you provide training? Because I think this is the entry point for me now. I'm so happy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very inciting and it's like a silver bullet. Um, my question is, you take a drone and you map the whole field and you get the information that there's a disease in this area or that area of the field. How accurate is that information? To what percentage in terms of significance, the information, or the accuracy of the plus or minus what? Yeah, man, maybe I didn't hear the beginning. Did you say you are part of the NEPAD group, that platform? Okay, so I just want to let you know that there is a, a platform on emerging technologies. Uh, which NEPAD is running with, and they are doing almost about what you are, you've spoken about. You may want to join them, and that is very promising because it's a whole program with a lot of funding. Then uh, we were in Senegal in March, and uh, we had a seminar, and the Senegalese are also far advanced, especially in doing medical imaging using artificial uh, intelligence. So. I can give you some contacts. The, uh, uh, our colleagues from the academy are also here. They can link you up with the people who can give you more information on what you are doing. Thank you. Yeah, what was the first question again? I forgot. <laughs> Oh yeah, that drone can carry, yeah, yeah. My natural intelligence is back. <laughs> so actually drip irrigation, right? When you set up those, they carry sensors which can detect what the plants need is part of precision agriculture. So precision agriculture is not only about drones. Anything that can sense uh, precisely what some portion of your field needs and then in some sense, either that same technology or an accompanying technology provide what it needs is precision agriculture. So a lot of technologies go into that. Now, when it comes to drones, uh, what some people do is that they've managed to connect a source of water to the drone. So there's some sort of uh, tube that connects the source of water to the drone itself. So as a drone is flying across the field, it's getting water directly, but then Actually, it is an, a, a debate we had in our team, which is better, using a drone or using just uh, drip irrigation with those uh, sort of pipes that spin around and then detect. So the argument is that because they are sort of in the soil and they are low level, they are still casting it wide. But then the drone is flying and can precisely look at this particular part of the plant or this particular plant and spray. But then there's a sort of like pros and cons depending on how you look at it. So both of them have the advantages and disadvantages. But the thing is that both of them are still part of uh, precision agriculture. Now the question about livestock farming 
and then Botswana. First of all, yes, I'm definitely open to meet having a discussion. Yes, <laughs> life stuff. So yes, there was actually um, the same drone, right? You can be able to, if you're familiar with, take for example, uh, facial recognition. So a lot of phones today are able to recognize the face of people. Uh, the iPhone has become popular for being able to unlock your phone with your face. That same technology, as part of AI, you can be able to use it to identify various livestock and track them. You can be able to detect certain diseases if they are obvious from the outside. So if, if it's something related to patches on the skin, you can be able to detect it. If it's internal, then you need sensors that can basically measure it. So take, for example, what we do in healthcare. So what you're asking for is that what we are doing for human beings, can we do it for animals? And the answer is yes. So it's a cross of maybe taking samples of blood and then collecting, generating a bunch of data from that, and then AI systems being able to analyze that. Or you can actually just put in tiny, tiny sensors that do not really put too much, um, too much burden on the livestock. You put it on them so that it's able to track them and also monitor their health. So it collects a lot of data, sends it to an AI system, and the AI system is always processing that data to see what diseases are they generating. Now, one thing we realize for dealing with human health is that not only can you detect diseases, you can actually predict diseases. So you can get early signs. The livestock might be healthy today, but you might tell that based on certain signs, they might get sick in the next few months. Then you step in to actually proactively do things. So this is all possible with livestock. So we can have that conversation and then see wh where we will start collecting that data and see how we can start uh, actually getting things done. Yeah. The next question was, uh... come again. Yes, error margin. Yes. Um... It varies depending on the system you're talking about. So the NDVI that I talked about that uses infrared cameras. You're talking to you're talking about close to say ninety-five to hundred percent accuracy. It's more of an equation that it just measures certain uh, lights emissions, and based on that, is able to conclude certain decisions. Yes, it has some uh inaccuracies out in in it but then when you compare it to having a human being come and then look at the leaf and then decide uh whether it's healthy or not it's a faster option and even probably more accurate in some sense because i don't think human beings are able to detect diseases 10 days before it becomes visible to the human eyes because as far as i'm concerned human beings only process visible light <laughs> we can't see an infrared and then beyond that, then maybe you might take a plant leave and then take it to the lab and do some tests. But then how many farms actually have access to all that? So as far as speed, affordability and all that, uh, this is the best option we have in the world. A lot of people have investigated it and uh, it's quite the best option we have in the world. But yes, highly accurate. But then once you get into the AI space, right, it really varies. It depends on certain things. Like I'll take... I'll give you an example with the Caragro AI system. So we have about 10 different AI systems that are working within the app for different crops. We realize a few interesting things. So when you build the app and the data you use focuses on images that were taken during daylight, when it gets darker, the app has a lot of problem. So when you test it during the day, it's easy to conclude that this is almost close to 99% accuracy. But the human eye is able to correct for lighting and all that, and, and, and uh, shading and all that. But AI system, unless you actually account for that data, so we realize that we need a lot of data that is taken maybe when it gets really late at night. So yes, it really, really varies. But then you can get it to perform at levels that are equal and in a lot of cases above human experts. And this is not just in agriculture, basically in every sector. In healthcare, we have AI system beat dermatologists, uh, radiologists in a lot of uh, cases. That is, that is not a commonality. Yeah. As far as the organization, yes, uh, I'm, I'm definitely open to having that discussion and seeing how we can work together because I think um, 
for me it's just it's just essential that we are open to this new ideas because i think it's very much necessary if you want to achieve food security in our part of the world and uh, we will need a whole new revival or not revival we need a whole new approach to how we go about agriculture and i think this in a short period of time that a lot of people have been taking it seriously has demonstrated quite concrete evidence to show that it's really up to the tax it might be the hidden ingredient or the silver bullet to achieving food security in the world as ibm said that basically this will help farmers uh, achieve and i think was it peter that was telling me a few days ago about how an organization some what 10 years ago was doing something similar and they were able to achieve really really incredible results it says that now these things have surfaced and they are way cheaper to be able to use so yeah let's see how we can all work together to achieve uh, our goals So let me first of all start by thanking the presenter for the uh, nice presentation, which is quite stimulating. Now, the only thing is that uh, uh, there was um, a comment uh, from Bahaid on the issue of the livestock and this technology. And also, I think there was uh, about the, the wildlife. Yes, currently we have technology of tracking the wildlife that is in Kenya. Uh, we have technology for tracking the wildlife in the national park. And also, even in the case of poaching currently these days, there's that technology whereby the, 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 the use with that, and then I'll put something through the skin, and uh, we have something, whatever it, that animal is, we're able to monitor uh, that animal, wherever that, that animal goes. And the same thing also, that technology is being used in the case of insecurity, past where there is insecurity, and people uh, steal animals from one community. Uh, we have that now technology, you can put them, and you're able to track them uh, using this technology. So for the person, I think the my colleague from uh, Botswana, I think we may try to uh, give, try to get in touch with the Kenya Wildlife Service, and perhaps they can give you more uh, information. Thank you. What you are talking about is very interesting. But in reality, how do you achieve it in terms of budgetary constraints and whether you can set up a laboratory whereby such components can be acquired in order to monitor and be able to get the data rather than to say use your phone and get the data realistically and scientifically it will not work so what actually are you aiming at okay sure um Really, you can actually achieve really tremendous results from just a phone's camera. That is not, it's not a theory. It's doable. And we do it more than just in agriculture. You, you have to realize that as I'm talking to you now, a lot of things that I'm depending on is, in, is just on my human body cameras, the two, the two that are before my eyes. And with that alone, I'm able to process a lot of information. We, we take it for granted, but phone cameras can actually collect of a lot of information. So it's not theory, it's doable. We've tested it and uh, there are good results. And even beyond agriculture, we've, there's actually, take, for, take, take this, right? 
you can be able to detect glaucoma in the human eye by taking a phone camera, adding just an adapter, and you can be able to detect glaucoma. That is possible. So it's not as if this is just a, a cool idea and it might not be practical as far as the phone one is doable and it's still free. Now, when you talk about what it would take to implement this, we're actually not requiring that farmers get drones. So the whole idea is that we have the drones and we come and fly them across their field and generate the information they need. Our AI system does the processing and they just have to access that information. So realistically, this could be like, we are talking about at best like 20, a few tens of dollars per each flight. Really, really affordable. That's because we have to host the data that we collect on the cloud and that can yeah so it's really not and again to some degree people are doing some versions of this across the world so it's not impossible and it doesn't require that farms have hundreds of thousands they can do it for next to nothing as as recorded from uh, one of that data i could save them up to what 35 to 40 50 percent as compared to manual labor so this is actually cheaper than manual labor that's one of the advantages. I don't know if uh, you are familiar with vertical farming. That actually takes it to a whole new level, which is where we are really interested in. Take, for example, this space. If we have 20 floors, rather than use so much land, we could have crops on 20 floors and we don't need any soil. All we need is water. And the water we use, we take it from the, f the last floor, bring it all the way down to the, the first floor, and then take it all the way back. We keep using the same water and then you save a lot of water you don't need soil so this is really really about resource management and the world is really really going in this direction it's at this point it's far away from research there's a lot of research things that we are interested in, in like how to improve fertilizers pesticides with some of these technologies those are things that a lot of people are not really looking at but in general precision agriculture is already in application there are a lot of farms that have been automated end to end it's already doable. There are farms where you have robots that actually pick up the fruits. No human beings goes to do anything. So it's already being done. But yeah, I do respect the academic side. So uh, as a researcher that works with researchers, we explored our region. But I just want to make the points clear. This is reality. It's already happening. We are late to the table. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, this is really exciting and revolutionary, a new age, and we either join in and move along or we're left behind. That's, that's the point we, you're making. We thank you very much, darling. And let's give him a, a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are about to uh, get to the closing.